The Bible says, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved. He who believes in Him is not condemned. He who does not believe is condemned already because he does not believe in the name of the only begotten Son of God. But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in His name. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith apart from the deeds of the law. This morning, the goal is, now that I have, well, now that I have been given an abbreviated time, that's going to be hard. So, we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1, of course. We're moving through chapter 1, and we're going to move through... 4, 5, and 6. I'm going to show what's called three verbals. Three verbals and the significance of those verbals. I'll have it here on the screen and I'll explain the significance of these three verbals and why it's important for us as believers and to show the consistency and faithfulness of God. Last week we looked at the grace and peace of God, and I'm just going to hit the last few slides again by way of review so that we can have the flow of where I'm going with this. So you'll recall last week we talked about, let me see if I can back up just a little, the doctrine of grace, we covered that. The phrase, you'll recall, the doctrines of grace is used inst instead of the word Calvinism. Do you guys remember that? We kind of reviewed the handout I gave you on TULIP. So we'll not go over that again. Grace is really all about what God is free to do for mankind based on the saving work of Christ, not the doctrines of grace. Now, might be a little confusing, so let me just back up here and just explain why I'm doing this or why I did this last week. When you look up the word grace online, what tends to come up is doctrines of grace. Doctrines of grace. That is not the same as grace coming from God. Doctrines of grace is what represents tulip or what is commonly known as Calvinism. They're not the same. That's why I explained what grace is all about. It's all that God is free to do based on what Christ had accomplished on the cross. So don't blur these two. They're not one and the same. Doctrines of grace is not the same concept as grace. They're different. They're distinct. So grace is all that God is free to do for mankind based on the saving work of Christ on the cross as well as the plan and policy of God bestowing His unmerited love and favor on sinful humanity. So that was from last week. And I pointed out that uh, grace addresses our weaknesses, or our weakness. In eternity past, God made a supreme resolution to treat us, fallen mankind, in grace. The fall of Adam brought death and condemnation to the whole human race, leaving us helpless to gain God's approval. There was nothing we could do. All that Adam and Eve could do is find fig leaves and cover themselves and run away from God. They were afraid. There was nothing we could do to gain God's approval. But God's plan of grace permits us to have rapport with Him forever. Under the under the divine policy of grace. God does everything for us. We cannot earn, we cannot deserve or work for anything in His plan. It has to start with God. Grace demonstrates the power, virtue, mercy and patience and pardon of God towards unworthy individuals such as ourselves. All for the glory of God and all without compromising His perfect essence.
classes of divine grace. We looked at common grace and saving grace. Common grace has to do with sustaining life, breathing air, and so on, and revealing the message of Christ's saving work. So all of all humanity has access to what's called common grace. For those who make the non-meritorious decision to believe in Christ after they have been exposed to common grace, God grants everlasting life and all the blessings of salvation as found under the category of saving grace. So as the faithful believer grows in grace and doctrine, he learns to depend on God's power and provision. And that's one of the primary reasons why we assemble together as believers in Christ. To learn how to depend on God's power. And some don't realize that God's power is accessible to us so that we live under his influence, un under his empowerment. So we no longer walk under the energy of the flesh. We also learn that he provides things, provision. He provides the jobs that we have. He provides the life that we currently have. He provides the love that we currently have with one another. He provides the church you currently are a part of. So provision, that category, falls under saving grace. God's plan for mankind, this is where we left off last week, is aligned and understood through the person of Christ. It always starts with Christ, John 1.17. In the greatest demonstration of grace, the perfect Son of God went to the cross in our place. What doctrine is that called? Anybody remember? He took our place. Substitutionary. Substitutionary. Doctrine of substitution. He took our place. Just like when we have substitute teachers in class, right? We have a teacher that subs. He subbed for us. The greatest demonstration of grace, the Son of God went to the cross in our place and was tried for our sins, of the, actually the sins of the world. His substitutionary sacrifice satisfied the righteous demands of God the Father. It is Christ's impeccable work, not our work, that frees God to grant his unmerited favor on sinful humanity. And those verses there on the bottom will buttress what I just said. Romans 3, Romans 5, Romans 8, Galatians 2, and 2 Timothy. So now, real quickly, doctrine of peace. As used in scripture, peace communicates the following doctrinal concepts. When we think of peace, biblical peace, it has to do with reconciliation. The removal of the barrier between God and man which was accomplished through Christ's work on the cross, resulting in the absence of personal conflict among believers and first and foremost among ourselves with God. All members of the body of Christ have been reconciled to God, so it follows logically that they should be reconciled to one another. Romans 7, Ephesians 6. Believers should utilize what has been provided in grace, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Sometimes we forget the inner calmness of the advanced believer. I specifically use the word advanced because the inner calmness is not realized or experienced until a believer understands that God is sovereign even in the midst of our circumstances. And once we embrace that and understand that as truth, then we can recognize the peace and the calmness that comes as a direct result of trusting in God. So one who is reconciled to God can also have the, what is it called? Peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension. So you could be in the midst of a war, literally, hearing, hearing the bullets fly over your head. And I've heard of men in the service who've heard bullets flying over their head and they're in a pit. And they're calm and collected because they have their Bible with them. 
a military Bible, and they're trusting in God. And I, I would say, the first time I heard that, I said, you know, that is a perfect example of trusting in God. So that even today, when we're in the midst of a fight, a battle, we can sit there and say, I'm trusting in God, because as those bullets or fiery darts are going up and around us, who's in charge? Who's sovereign? God remains in control. Even though we're afraid and timid, <clears throat> maybe a little terrified and even upset, God still remains in control. So he loves you, he's in charge, but that peace that surpasses all understanding is a direct result of the advanced believer. It isn't for just any believer. That isn't going to come or happen to you until you, would, you mature. You understand that God remains sovereign. He's in control. That's faith rest, ladies and gentlemen. That's trusting in Him. You cannot experience Philippians 4 unless you follow through the rest of the verse. What, what does it say in Philippians 4, 7? What's the protocol? It says, be anxious for nothing. Then what? But in everything with prayer, supplication with... Thanksgiving. That, that's the protocol to experience the peace that surpasses all understanding. That's the mark of someone who is mature. Because they can give thanks in the middle of it. Not, well, you know, uh, this is a great day. Even if it's not so great, you can still give thanks. Because we're supposed to give thanks how often? Always. Always. So if you can't give thanks even in the middle of a battle, that's not the mark of a mature believer. You're supposed to be able to give thanks in the midst of it because when you interlock the rest of Scripture, be anxious for nothing, count it all joy when you encounter what? Trials and tribulations. Once you understand the verses are all foundational and it goes before our sovereign God, before the throne of grace, and it's not until you trust that will you be able to experience what we're saying here. Inner calmness, peace that surpasses all comprehension. Because if it doesn't surpass all understanding, then you have something to do with it. You did something to contribute to the peace that you're currently experiencing. But if you're experiencing peace that goes beyond understanding and comprehension, that comes only from God, ladies and gentlemen. Because according to Philippians 4, 7, it's something that you yourself cannot understand. That's divine. That's a direct result of faith rest. Not because Freddie did it, not because David did it, but because God supplied the peace that goes beyond our capability to understand how it happened. And why does He supply the peace? A couple reasons. One, he proves that he's faithful. Two, to show you that, is not, it, that it's not contingent upon your circumstances, that it's relational at all times. All times. The believer faithful to that plan gradually acquires a mental attitude that remains what? Stable through adversity and prosperity. It's a mental ability that you've allowed yourself to grow into as a direct result of faith resting and trusting in God. Trusting in God. So let's move on now. We're now on verse 4. So we saw grace and peace. Remember the order starts with grace, then peace. You can't have peace without first passing through grace. That takes us now to verse 4. I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus. So Paul reflects on the Corinthians' past experience. By the way, I'll probably add this in the next several Sundays. I, Again, I was told to, we have to abbreviate this, so I'm not going to be able to pack everything into these next few verses. But I want you to see that Paul is thanking God. For who? The Corinthians. Now, 
let me just read a few things that they were guilty of. They were guilty of division and quarreling. You find this in verses 10 and 13, chapter 1. Sexual immorality, immorality you find that in chapter 5, 1 through 13. They were guilty of lawsuits among believers. They were guilty of idolatry and participation in pagan feasts. Disorderly worship. So those are just some of the things that we're going to hit as we move forward. Why am I saying this? Because Paul in this verse here says, I thank God for you all. Do you notice that? I thank my God always concerning you. So even though they were sinners, he was able to find reason to thank God for them. How can we use this in practical application? Do you have believers that you don't get along with? Obviously not here in NCBC. But maybe you know people in other churches, or maybe, maybe there is someone here. Maybe you don't get along with me. Hopefully that's not true. Well, hurry up and finish, Freddie. <laughs> so maybe it's something along those lines, right? But I want you to see what divine perspective looks like. I thank my God, how often? Sometimes? Always. In spite of their shortcomings, in spite of their sins, he still has within himself the ability to thank God always concerning you. Here's the word. You see the word for? That word for is epi. Epi. I thank God, my God, always concerning you, epi. When you see the word for in this verse, Paul is saying, on the basis of. I can thank God, epi, on the basis of the grace of God which was given to you. The reason why Paul can thank God is epi, the grace of God. Which was given to me? No. Given to you all. By Christ Jesus. So Epi introduces why Paul can be thankful for these bozos who were sinning galore. And likewise, maybe you have family member members. Maybe you have other believers in different churches. Maybe you have people that you are at odds with. Epi, we can, ha we can still be thankful for the grace of God that has been given to them. So now, Paul reflects on the Corinthians' past experience of God's grace. I thank God always concerning you for the grace of God. What's the words in blue? Was given. That's the first <coughs> verbal. Was given. This is Eros tense passive voice. So when we use the arrow's tense, it's the idea of decisive, definitive action in contrast to continual action. It's a one-time shot, one-shot deal back then to the Corinthians. It's not ongoing. It's a one-time decisive action as specified in the words was given. So passive voice, it's not something they did to themselves or for themselves. God did it. Got it? So the Eros tense conjoined with the passive voice emphasized the completeness of God's action in the past. The Corinthians received grace as a definitive act enriching them, enriching them comprehensively. So they were given grace was given. Was given, what tense is that? In English. That's past. past. It was given to them in the past. Something that they already had and possessed in the past. I thank my God always concerning you, Epi. What was the basis? The grace of God, which was given to you by 
Christ Jesus. That's verse 4. Verse 5. Here's another verbal. That you are enriched in everything by Him in all utterance and all knowledge. Paul affirms the past enrich, enrichment of the Corinthians. That you, what's the words here? Were enriched. Were enriched. In everything by Him in all speech, that's for the word utterance, and all knowledge. So, speech and knowledge. Were enriched. What tense is this? Past tense again. So they were, what's the first one? Was given. And the second one, were enriched. Both, both in time past, in the past, right? So were enriched, again, aorist tense, passive voice. These three verbals are aorist tense, passive voice. Which means, again, for the tense, it's decisive and definitive in contrast to a continual action. It's a one-time deal in 1 Corinthians 1.5 when they were enriched. It's not ongoing. It's in the past they were enriched. It has nothing to do with ongoing action. It's a one-time deal where they were, they were enriched. The believers were. The Corinthians were. It's not something they did to themselves or for themselves. God did it. So the bottom line for this verse, <clears throat> this highlights or underscores the completed action of God's enrichment in the past, highlighting its comprehensive nature. They were enriched in everything by Christ in all speech and in all knowledge. Verse 5. <clears throat> Doing pretty good with time. Verse 6, last verbal. Was confirmed. Was confirmed. Even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you. Was confirmed. Last verbal. This reaffirms the past confirmation of the testimony of Christ even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed. When was that in English? Past tense. All three were in the past tense. But in Greek, this is aorist tense, which is a decisive and definitive action in contrast to a continual action. It's not present tense. One time shot. So they were confirmed, was confirmed in you. So it's not something they did to themselves or for themselves. God did it. What did he do? He confirmed in you. What? The testimony of Christ. So this verse underscores the firm estab establishment of the gospel message within the Christian Corinthian community of believers confirming the truth of Christ within them as they would assemble together. So there you have the three verbals. There's something else I wanted to highlight since I have two more hours. I think this is important. We have time anyways. So that you come short in no what? Here we encounter the present reality of God's grace in the Corinthians' lives so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 7. The present tense participle waiting in this verse signifies the ongoing nature of the Corinthians' experience, empowered by God's grace as they eagerly await Christ's return. Here's, here's what I want you to see. Very, very important. <clears throat> This is the only church that did not lack gifts. This is the only church. No other church in the scripture 
can make claim to what Paul says here to this church. So that you come short in no what? No gift. This is the only church in the New Testament which is said to lack in no gifts. So what's my point? I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you might be saying, so what? Big deal. Remember this? Someone read this for me, please, while I sip water. My brethren could not speak to you as to spiritual people, but as to control as the babes in Christ for perfect freedom. Carl. Carl. Okay. Yeah. So please hear me out. I'm going to put my notes here. Based on 1 7, the verse that we saw, and what Paul says here, we can conclude that spiritual gifts and spirituality are not the. Does that make sense? So, some churches will equate spirituality with gifts. Correct? If you don't do this, you're not spiritual. If I don't hear you doing this, you're not spiritual. And yet, what did we see here? I guess I can't. Let me see. Bear with me here. Now we're going to pass 11.15 with the way I'm doing this. <laughs> so that you come short in no gift. Remember what I said earlier? This is the only church in the New Testament where they lacked in no gift. And yet, same book, this is chapter 1, verse 7, same book now, in chapter 3, Paul says to the brethren, I could not speak to you as spiritual. So if the Corinthian church was considered to not have or not to lack in any spiritual gifts, and by the time he gets to verse 3, he says, I could not speak to you as spiritual people, then we can deduce that to say gifts equates to spirituality is not one and the same. They had the gifts as per 1.7. It was not lacking in any gifts. But when he gets to chapter 3 verse 1, he could not speak to them as spiritual people. You follow that? So spirituality and gifts are not one and the same. Some will say, David, if you're not doing this, you're not spiritual. And that's not correct based on the book of Corinthians. Paul says in Corinthians, this church lacked in no gifts. By the time you get to chapter 3, I could not speak to you as spiritual people. Why? There were three aspects, three sins that were being uh, that he saw and noticed within the Corinthian church. Let's go there really quickly since we have four minutes. I'll read it for the recording. Chapter 3, 1 Corinthians. Verse 1. Brethren, and I, brethren, could not speak to you as spiritual people, but as to carnal as to babes in Christ, I fed you with milk and not with solid food, for until now you were not able to receive it. And even now you are still not able to. So here is the spiritual group of believers called the Corinthians. Paul could not address them as spiritual, even though they lacked in no gifts. 1 7. So. Having gifts is not the same as being spiritual. That's my point. That's all I'm trying to say there. So, 
that will conclude our message today so that we can accommodate the puppeteers. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you as always for giving us the opportunity to look into your word. We know how vital this is. We know how important this is. So even if we have an abbreviated message today, we can still see that, as Jesus said here, a man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. We can still see the significance of looking closely at every word that proceeds out of your word, out of your mouth. Thank you for this time, and we ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.